The Con Panel. Brought to you by Old Brother Productions and Norse Legion. Hi, folks. Welcome to The Con Panel. This is our seventh episode. And with me, as always, of course, is the host, Kevin Lyle. Kevin, how you doing today, bud? Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, Paul. Yes. Is there... Is your face on that pillow behind you? It is on that pillow, yes. Yeah, so my face is there. Do you, you want to ask why? No, actually, I want a better look of it before I start criticizing you. why the frick you have your face on a pillow. What is that? Can you show that to me? I, I can. Uh, give me a second here. Let me take the cans off. I want my face on a pillow. Jim, very much, very much. I have to close the talk until you're introduced. That, that is the pillow. Oh. <laughs> so there's a pillow with your face on it. Or just keep talking, Paul, so that people can see it. Right. So this is the uh, Paul's Pub uh, pillow. This is swag. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you put it down and do it so it's not facing me? Because the whole, <laughs> the whole intro to this, when we were talking to our guests, it was <laughs> staring at me, and it was scaring the heck out of me. But one thing it's not scaring the heck out of me is the awesome guest we have this year, because this week, I should say. And uh, it's really cool. He's the uh, was one of the designers for the original Kenner line from the 1970s and 80s that we all grew up with. And without further ado, here he is, live from Kentucky, Mr. Jim Swearingen. How you doing, sir? Yeah. Good. Good. Thanks for having me. It looks like you have uh, quite a collection behind you. What do you uh, What do you got there? I have. Well, I have to admit, I have. I only have a collection because of. Of, uh, collectors giving me collection because I admitted to a lot of people that the only two things I kept all these 40 years the three things was my my x-wing from 1978 and my and the x-wing and tie fighter that I gave my mother because my mother got a sample of every product that I worked on when I was at Kenner and she luckily didn't get them out of the box or play with them, so I got them back a few years well, a few years ago. Actually, now, twenty years ago. So, uh, and then I have some figures and stuff that uh, people have been gracious enough to, to uh, give me. You know, I have a set of the first twelve only because collectors found out I didn't have a set of twelve figures. So I have those. They're in shadow boxes here and here. Oh, okay, I see that. Very, uh, very cool. Now, um, is that the original box they came in, or is that something they just kind of came up with and gave it to you? No, I've made, I've found some shadow boxes. They're just, you know, they're out of, uh, I think they're from Michaels. And then I put backdrop, they have backdrops in them. <laughs> and that's an original Boba Fett. I've had that one for a while. Right. And this in, is in and out of the box. <laughs> and uh, there's, Actually, that C-3PO there mm -hmm. and is uh, from Michael. Even. <laughs> is, and, C uh, is C-3PO the one on the, uh, is, is C-3PO the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on this side is actually, unfortunately, he, he went to Germany with me and that is a pre-production never sonic sealed C-3PO, which was probably worth a lot of money except that in Germany, he fell off a table and broke his ankles, so. Oh, man. Where in, uh, where in Germany, I got to ask? I used to, I used to live there. Uh, I went, when I, I went to Norse Force in Nuremberg, first Nuremberg. Okay, Bavaria, very four nice. Year, uh, three and a half years ago. Yeah, they were, it was a really good show. It's a, they put on a really, they do an every four-year extravaganza that's really nice. Now, um, uh, let's go a little bit back in time now and talk about you. You obviously were there in the beginning. What, what got you into before you got into Star Wars? What got you into designing toys? Uh, I uh, I can go way back uh, when I was in high school. I was uh, an artsy kid. I did sets for the plays at school, and uh, I did art classes and in and out of school, and then. Uh, I had an art teacher that said, if you want to make some money as a creative person, consider industrial design. So I ended up at the uh, University of Cincinnati in the co-op program there. And my last uh, three co-op sections were with 
first with Rainbow Crafts and then finally with Kenner. So I started working uh, at Kenner in 1972. Oh, good for you. I, I wish I had a teacher like that. I didn't get into industrial design until uh, until my late 30s. I, I did I did illustration and pen work and stuff like that, which yeah. doesn't pay the bills very much. But uh, but anyway, so you, you got to Kenner in 1972? Yep. And what kind of stuff were they doing before Star Wars? I'm sure they were doing something. I just, I don't know. Well, they, um, I worked a lot on, I had one of my co-op sections with those Rainbow Crafts, which is where Play-Doh was made, was invented. And they had been rolled into Kenner by General Mills. So I was working on Spirograph and uh, Play-Doh. And um, I'm trying to think other stuff. We did an awful lot of uh, preschool-y stuff. And at that time, they were doing SSPs and Easy Bake Oven had been around a long time. And then came uh, Baby Alive and Stretch Armstrong, stuff like that. Okay. I I remember Stretch Armstrong. It was one of the very few toys I had before 78. Was it Paul? Did you have a Stretch Armstrong? I did. Yeah, and I uh, did. it was one of those funny things. Did you ever accidentally poke a hole in your stretch, though? <laughs> yes, I did. You don't accidentally do it. You purposely do it. <laughs> well, you know, at, at the time, Kenner was the largest consumer of corn syrup in the world. <laughs> <laughs> of course they were. <laughs> so is that what that was? That was corn syrup? It was distilled corn syrup. They would heat it up and, you know, make it thick enough. But there were, for, for a year, a, a couple of years, we had tankers of corn syrup lined up in Brotherton Road in, New, in uh, Norwood, you know, just offloading syrup. And it was cooked down in the... Uh, at the plant so yeah we we went through a you know tankers of of uh corn syrup you know the people who are like the people who are under 35 listening to this paul are like what the, <laughs> what hell? the hell are what they talking are about talking about yeah so anyway let's talk about tang oh, no. oh. <laughs> so so now we're going to get into a little bit of history of your of your career and if you've seen the netflix series Paul, have you seen this, the Netflix series, The Toys That Made Us? Love that show. That Love was, that uh, I only saw one episode. I bet you can guess which episode I saw. <laughs> he man of the Masters of the Universe. It was the one that Jim was in, and it was, uh, it was uh, the Star Wars one, of course. And um, so anyway, so, so judging by that show, I guess in 1976 or so, Jim, uh, Lucasfilm approached you guys, or you approached them. How'd that work? Yeah, uh, well... Yeah, they had they had been shopping it around as it was as in the show. I mean, if people haven't seen Netflix, uh, 20th Century Fox and Lucasfilm had been shopping Star Wars for almost a year, um, maybe not quite, maybe nine months, to every toy company in the states. They had been to Hasbro and Ideal, Mego. Um, they'd been all over Mattel at all. Everybody had passed it up. And um, about a couple months before, I think it's a month or two before I, before I have a prop, before uh, Kenner got it, this magazine came out. I don't know if you can read it. It's a, it Star was Log number magazine. two. It was the second issue of Starlog magazine. And then this is just the cover, but, that was where I read the three paragraphs that announced that Lucas, who had done THX 1138, and 20th Century Fox were doing a movie called Star Wars. And when the script came in, uh, at that point I was working in uh, preliminary design, which was the advanced concepts area at Kenner. We, uh, we looked at TV properties. I worked on Six Million Dollar Man, uh, we looked at all kinds of TV stuff because back in the 70s, all the TV shows started in September. The new shows premiered in September and they ran till Christmas. And we were looking at TV properties because they were perfect advertising for toys, you know, because they ran during our season, the big season for toys. So uh, among those things, uh, the script for Star Wars came in 
somewhere between November of 76 and February of 77. And uh, Dave Okada, my boss, brought the script in with some black and white photographs and said, oh, we got this movie property. And I'd already read about it. So it was like, I, I, I want that. That's my project. So I took it home that night, read the script that night, and looked through the black and white photographs of the live action, because the live action was all done. Came back and the next morning gave it back to David and said, sit in your office and close the door for a couple hours because we need to do this. This is, you know, this is just loaded with toys. And uh, he did. So, and then we had to convince marketing at uh, Kenner uh, that all those other toy companies were wrong because it, it had the three strikes. It was a movie it would could be in and out in a couple of weeks. It was science fiction, and uh, Paramount had already screwed up science fiction with the Star Trek stuff they had done. And then it was opening in May, which is like counter to the toy business. So it was going to be opening. And the, the fourth strike, if you had to have a fourth strike, was it was opening in a couple months. And... It take at that point, and still today, it takes almost a year to get a toy on the shelf from China, so or anywhere. So we had to convince Kenner that we were right, that the designers were right, and it was a designer-driven project, and that uh, all those other people were wrong. And then we had to convince 20th Century Fox that we we were big enough to do the project. So. The push was on. We had a couple of months uh, to work up a, prod a product line, and we made our first presentation in March of 77 to 20th Century Fox. So we had Alan Ladd and uh, Mark Pevers was the, the marketing guy at 20th Century Fox, and uh, Charlie Lippincott, I think, might have been there. George was not in the meeting, but we went out with trunk a couple trunk loads of stuff it looked like we had arrived from uh it was kind of like chevy chase's vacation movies we had this big chevrolet station wagon piled with these shipping crates of the products the concept stuff that we did all these rough models all the stuff that i was working on and we had we were going we were uh loading and unloading it a couple times at the hotel and, and, and then at 20th Century Fox. So, and we made our first presentation and uh, then the race was on. And then uh, April 4th was my first present, my first trip out to California. The second trip actually, but by myself, it was the second time. And that's when I got to see the, the dailies and see the uh, studio, the ILM studio in Van Nuys, so. And then if I, could I just, into it. if I could just interrupt you, because I love the sound of my voice, um, <laughs> when did you guys sign the actual contract? Because I'm thinking, if you guys sign the contract after June, Lucasfilm's gonna know it's a hit, and that's gonna change all their numbers. When did you guys actually sign with them? They were working, they, the, the marketing department was working on deal points after the March meeting, but they were they didn't sign they didn't actually sign. I don't I'm not sure the date. It was in May before the movie opened. They finally signed at least a letter of intent with the deal points. So they'd settled that stuff. Um, yeah, because it wasn't until it wasn't until June when the ball really started rolling with the success of it. Because oh, when, yeah. when Star Wars came out, it was only in thirty nine. Uh, theaters. It broke 39 records in those 39 theaters, but for the first two weeks, it was only in a few theaters. I think it was uh, uh, J J uh, June 7th is when it started going wide, and that's when it started getting pretty big. Well, but anyway, so they knew they they had a pretty good idea that they were they were having a success because the uh, the May issue, the May 30th issue of Time Magazine, had dropped middle of the month, and it had six pages talking about the best movie of the year. So that was about the, the time they were signing the contract. I've never actually gone back and researched it, but Bernie Loomis signed the letter of intent and the deal points 
somewhere in May, and it was the same timing. We could probably find out. It's, uh, it was they signed it the same day that uh, Mattel was having their uh, shareholders meeting, and they had already gotten wind at, at Mattel that things that this is can be something because the uh, management had to tell the uh, shareholders why they didn't take the Star Wars license. So it was Bernie intentionally signed it on the day that the, because he had been, he'd been a, a president of Mattel for, and left there to come back, come to Kenner. So he was kind of putting the screws to Mattel by signing it at that time, so. Now, uh, let me see if I can remember this correctly. Is Bernie the, the gentleman whose hand is exactly three and three quarters and that's why the figures are that size? Uh, well, that's the folklore. Oh, it's the folklore. Yes, that, that's the folklore. I, I don't know where that started, or but it's, uh, and I I only know it's folklore because the figures that I used on the very first mock-ups that everybody's seen, the first kit bash models that I built, the Fisher Price action figures, the act the what do they call them, adventure people, were actually three and three quarter inches tall. So this, the, it's, it's a very nice story. So I can't claim it one way or the other. But my, my recollection is, well, maybe, but I wasn't in the meeting and I just know that because the collector said, well, you know those figures, it's three and three quarter inches tall. And I said, I went, I measured it to make sure. And I said, yeah, you know they are. Because somebody said he thought they should be a little bigger. They should be this big, not this big. That may have been based on my drawings because the original drawings were smaller, but it's really hard to tell. But I love it. It's a great story. <laughs> and now I just, it's just so funny because I was in this meeting and this, you know, the, this uh, collector guy that knows way more, knows so much detail uh, said, well, you know, those figures are three and three quarter inches tall. And I'm like, are you sure? And sure enough, it's, uh, it's true that, I don't know, the lumberjack that I made Han Solo out of is uh, three and three quarter inches tall, so. Well, well there you go. Do you, uh, do you have a favorite figure? Uh, my favorite character probably is C-3PO. I, I, he, I kind of relate to him because, uh, you know, I'm kind of a geeky character and I used to be very skinny. I'm not as skinny as I used to be, but I like his the skinniest person on the con panel right now. He's he's the sure. only he's the only characters that's in all nine movies. You know, he and R two D two. So mm -hmm. he's he's been he's been with with me longer than most of the other characters. Okay, is is that your favorite figure as well? Because it is an interesting figure. Because he's yeah, oh, I love him. I think a lot of detail. Yeah, he, he's a great. Dude. Paul, do you have a favorite Star Wars figure? I do. Uh, and if we're talking about the, the original, it would definitely be Darth Vader. Uh, I was so ready to go. Whatever answer you say, I was going to go wrong. But no, you're right. It's Darth Vader. It's Darth Vader. <laughs> the, only, uh, the only one I have. There you go. My parents, can, Jim, you're going to hate this, but my parents convinced me in 1983 to get rid of my figures because I was 12 years old and the time, no, 84, 1984, the time had come that I'd outgrown my Star Wars figures and I threw them away, all of them. Ah! <laughs> oh no. What the dark floor. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every story I've heard like that. Yeah, but mine sounded you, bitter. I heard so many sad stories from people that are uh, younger than me. You know, I was 27 when I did, when I worked on Star Wars. But those, all those seven and eight year olds that come up to the Comic Cons now and go, you know, I, my mother, you know, my mother threw them out or they were in the yard sale or they burned them at the stake and stuff. It was, you know, how many figures were blown up, you know, with firecrackers just because it was cool. Yeah, I had a lot of friends in high school that would do that with their figures. So that was like four years after I threw mine out, and I felt bad looking at it. I was like, I was a little upset because I took it as a 
almost like a religion. I can't believe I threw mine out. I feel terrible. God, now I've depressed myself, Paul. I don't know what you're going to do. I have a bar over there. You can come over to have a couple of drinks, talk about it, you know. Maybe later. So, Mr. <laughs> Swearing, so moving right along, you, um, you, you guys, were you part of, the, um, did you just do figures or did you work also on play sets? Did you give any advice on those? I did, well, I did all the preliminary design on the X-Wing and TIE Fighter. And the, uh, the, uh, the Death Star playset. I was hoping you were going to say Death Star playset because that was by far, this was my favorite toy as a kid. And my second favorite toy was the, was the, was the yeah. playset, the Death Star playset. Was what was your favorite part? Was the, tr the trash compactor? Well, my favorite. Okay. Oh, you Sorry. I thought you were <laughs> <laughs> Who's being interviewed here? <laughs> It's a wide open question. Anybody just chime in. No. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, Jim. What's your favorite place? Well, that, What's that's, your favorite part of the desk? Well, that's a pretty good piece. I mean, it, that, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the mechanism for the first model was made from a Play-Doh extruder, the crank on it. That was, that was a, uh, that was a, a Play-Doh extruder and, I didn't have anything. The monster was done in production design, and I liked I, the the first model was you know part Kip Bash and part part the model shop because we had a great model shop. The guys that put those the X Wing and Tie Fighter. I did the layout drawings. They did all the actual model work. So um, we had a, our own preliminary design was a separate area of Kenner where you weren't you know people couldn't wander in and out. So we could do stuff like Star Wars was top secret at Kenner until uh, until May. I mean, there were people around that knew, but we uh, we were in a separate area, so you didn't just wander around. And we had our own model shop; they could do almost anything with the the stuff. So it it was uh, I. So those are the the big ones. The place that was. I recently saw a collector that had it done the full round of them. They, they did a, I think it's eight sets of it, and they, they had all the, you know, it makes it a little hard to play with, but it was cool to see it because it, it was designed to be a half, half the, half a desk. Just, and just to explain it to uh, the people who might not know, the the Death Star itself is built. If you look at it from from the above, it's like a triangle piece. It's like a pie piece, like this. And he's talking about if you can put all of them in a row. And I think it was like nine. I saw, I saw a picture of that too, which means I need to buy eight more to get one. Uh, I do have one now. I just got rid of the one I had when I was a kid. I love that set. That's one I don't have. So anybody out mine? there that has one, they can send me. Do you want to buy mine? <laughs> no, I don't want to buy them. No. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm Jim Sparrington. <laughs> they just throw crap at me. <laughs> Oh, let it tell with the light. So, I I, so does this mean like 20 years from now, people are going to throw jewelry at me? Because I, I, I designed Star Wars jewelry. So anyway, yeah. moving right along. Paul, did you say what your favorite part of Death Star was? Definitely the trash compactor trash for me. Compactor. Yeah. I, my favorite part, I think, was the levels. The fact that it was on so many different levels. There were so many different things to do. It was the gift that kept on giving. Christmas, 1979. That's when I got mine. There you go. But, um, okay, so uh, moving along. Did you... Uh, did you work on, on Empire? I worked on the er, very early on. Uh, before Empire, I did. I worked on the uh, Boba Fett, the preview for Empire Strikes Back that we did, the figure. You worked for the, the Send Away Boba Fett? Yeah. Ooh, that's, like, that's like that's like one of the holy grails. Yeah. I, I had two of them. And I okay, so this, is, this is an important question because there's so many rumors. How many rocket firing Boba Fett's did they make? Because I know there's a rumor there's 10 or something out there. And we got another guest who's coming in a couple minutes. He's going to know more about this than anyone on earth. And uh, is it 120? That's my guess. I, you could, because by the time they got into that far into it, I was already on to something else. I only did one, and that was the kit bashed one. Please tell me it's in your house. No. Nope. Oh. <laughs> I was waiting. Yeah. I, uh, the way it worked, the way the projects worked was I would, that, that one, for example, 
I went out to California with Dave Okada. I took pictures of the first model, the first uh, costume, took turnarounds, they had a guy come out, they had somebody dress up and George showed us the figure and I took photographs. The first photographs I was allowed to take of the set stuff. And then I came back to Cincinnati and kitbashed the, the, uh, the model that uh, we use for presentations, the one that's in the photographs. The, it's a C-3PO body and some arms and legs of some, and the head I think is, the, the collectors know more of what I used for it, but um, it was typical of my kit bashing. It was body putty and as an X-Acto knife and paint. So, I, but I modeled the first, the first three and three quarter, this three and three quarter figure. And that was the one we used for uh, presentations and stuff. The backpack was made from a Japanese, I collected uh, Shogun warrior kind of Japanese figures. And I took one of their missile firing mechanisms and used that for the uh, backpack. Now, was that, was that a toy line from the Richard Chamberlain miniseries? No, I think that these were straight from Japan. They're okay, I see, Shogun I see. The, pre, the precursors to Shogun Warriors. Oh. <clears throat> that's what we used for the first mechanism. And then the one that's in the, you know, in production was done at Kenner. So. And that, the people say they bought one that was in the package and all that stuff, but I think that's all baloney. But... I don't know enough. <laughs> well, um, I think it's time we could probably bring on somebody who probably knows more about the subject than uh, at least myself and Paul, I'm sure. But uh, straight from Nashville, Tennessee, and I see Nashville, Mr. Michael Havens. How you doing, Mike? Hey, oh, what's up, Kevin? How's it going? Hey, Jim. How you doing, Paul? How's it going? How you Goes. guys doing? Good. Thanks for coming. So oh, you heard oh, we man. had some questions about the uh, rocket firing uh, Boba Fett and... Uh, I'm sure you know more than I do, so hit it, Mike. Yeah, I know I don't have one. Um, I had a chance to buy one for, uh, it was twenty five grand about three years ago, and I said, no way, that's too much. My max price is going to be twenty grand, and uh, it sold, and then the next one sold for sixty five, and the next one sold for like one ten. <laughs> so I blew that one, but uh, essentially it's just a Boba Fett. Here's a Boba Fett. He's on my desk, but it's just a Boba Fett, and then what happened is in the back, they would have a little lever. I don't have any of the fake ones. There are fake ones out there, but I'm very anti-repro. Um, but there's just a little lever, and it, sh it would shoot this part of the rocket out of it. So it was just a regular three and three-quarter boba. They did the, uh, the offer where you could send in the pops, and if you sent in the pops, you can get this mail-away boba fet, which uh, Jim made, and he's so coy about it. But that, uh, that kit bash boba fet he's talking about is – just about the rarest piece in vintage Star Wars lore. Um, nobody's found it yet, uh, but when they do, it'll be mine. <laughs> do, you think, do, you, do you think it's out there? I think everything's out there, man. If anybody's like me, I, I, I could get you my book reports from second grade, man. I mean, I keep everything. Everybody keeps everything. Yeah, I don't the, know. There's only a couple. Except you, you throw out all your stuff. Apparently, well, apparently I have bad parents, and that's just, uh, <laughs> I don't understand it, but, um, so anyway, so, so, so Mike, since we have you on, yeah, you're talking about just how lucky and smart of a business guy you are, just, Mike is from, um, ICCC, uh, which is the hat he's wearing, and everything's all over his truck, all the marketing for it, but it's a great, uh, it's a great convention held, uh, usually held in September in, uh, yep. in Nashville, or in Franklin, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. But um, so this year you decided to change it to April for next year. Yes. Which was very fortunate of you because of all that's going on in the world. And now your show is going to be, uh, well, you can talk about it for a second. Yeah, no, well, I got really lucky, man. Um, what happened is there's this other big uh, corporate kind of convention that had the dates. They kind of pushed right up against my September dates. They went to the end of August. And uh, so I had to get out of the way. Um, cause we're just, you know, we're only going into our third year and even though it's a big convention, it's, there is no corporate entity behind it. So I don't have the big guns to fight those kind of things. So we moved, we said, all right, we're going to move it to April. No problem. Um, I looked for venues. I went Springfield, Ohio or Springfield, Missouri. I went up to Ohio. I went out to even Seattle looking for a different venue. 
Um, and then we decided to keep it in Nashville and we moved it down to uh, actual Nashville proper. It used to be in Franklin, Tennessee. So it's a nice four star hotel in Nashville proper now. And uh, we moved it down there and we moved it way back in, shoot, I think December, I already had the contract signed. Um, so it was just very fortuitous that we missed the whole pandemic thing. And I'm sure we'll all be out of it by then. I mean, we're very lucky and we're able to still talk about planning and uh, guest stars and things we're going to do and new VR experiences and Kevin Leal doing the uh, the panels there. And, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> And Jim Swearingen coming down and bringing me that kit bash fat and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, now speaking of guests on your show, I noticed you you posted a video with you and uh, you and uh, uh, Phil Philip Brown. Brown. Philip Brown not, is my not, con manager. Not Phil Brown from Star Wars, but Phil Brown, the con manager. Gotcha. Correct. Um, yes. And you, he actually you does said. conventions for notaries. You know the notaries, right? But you he does the big conventions for them. That's why I'm in better hands than I should be. My show, Hushy Hush. Oh, uh, no, said, talking over you now. That's it. No, you, said, uh, you, um, you had mentioned in that, sh that episode that um, the thing you put on yesterday, that you had separate rooms for things, and this is where Jim Swearingen is going to be. So are you going to publicly announce Jim to come to your show next year? Oh, Jim's definitely coming to my show. Jim, you're coming to my show forever. I love Jim Swearingen. We're actually, we've turned into friends, and he lets me call him Jim. How cool is that? Because, <laughs> like, I'm a Star Wars nerd since I'm a little kid, and he literally invented, like, I mean... I have a serious Boba Fett issue. I mean, this is just my desk here. A Boba Fett like, fetish. Like my real desk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Jim yeah, Paul invented Paul. my favorite toy of all time. So yes, he will always come. Um, I don't usually announce guest stars. Well, I did announce guest stars early last year. That wasn't the best way to go. Um, so now I'm doing it slow like every other con does. So just um, go, yes, Jim. Yes, Jim's going to come. Of course, if, as long as you'll come, Jim. I, I'm planning on it. All right, perfect. Well, no, what we're going to do is for you guys, we're going to set up the founder's room. And that way people can come in and really, you know, talk to you, talk to Kim, talk to even, we have Ron Rudat that comes out and he did GI Joe's. Um, but you guys, sometimes you don't, you don't look at it this way, but you really, not only did you create a toy or have a job when you were 27 years old, you created something that gave people like me and all these other nerds look at look at the videos here jim look at behind these guys and that's stuff that you created and made us have and that's that's wonderful so yes you're always coming i <laughs> yes we'll go to dinner you and emery come out we'll have a blast brother no worries now i'm going to put you on the spot michael i'm going to ask you uh -oh. is it michael or mike doesn't matter call me whatever you want don't call me late for dinner Oh, 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 okay, I'll, I'll try not to do that. Um, do you have a question for Mr. Swearingen? Something that you don't know about ah, the See? When's the exact last second you saw the kit bash Boba Fett and who has it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought there might be another question. You know what? What other question? When you come to my convention? What do you want? Go no. for it. What do you, Kevin, give me the question. What's the question? I didn't do my homework, everyone. Why are you a smart ass? There's your question. Why? Oh, dude, I, I've been practicing for this my entire life, man. It's what I do. <laughs> anyway, any, Paul, by the way, we forgot to ask the audience, people watching on live, if they want to comment on the con panel live page on Facebook. They They're doing that right now. And they, are there people asking questions? Oh, yeah. And actually, one of them we had just answered, which was, what was his favorite toy to design? And that was uh, C-3PO. So thank you, are, thank you for bringing up what happened seven minutes ago. Good job. <laughs> see, see, if you can, uh, see if you can find another way. So, Mr. Swearingen. Yes. <laughs> sorry, we went, off, we went off on a Boba Fett tangent there, but we, we, love, we love Boba Fett. He doesn't and, like uh, the Fett. Well, I can tell you, Boba Fett, that model, the way it worked at Kenner was that model that I built, I would do the parts layout, I would do a parts breakdown, and we'd get a preliminary cost from Carl Rave or somebody like that at Kenner. And we would take that and uh, turn it over to production design group. And I don't remember who at that time was doing production design, but they would take the, the cost sheet and the model, and then they'd work on you know doing the production development of it. And then it in theory, when they were finished with that model, would come back to prelim and be put into the morgue. We had a 
we had a a big room in on the eleventh floor of the Kroger building that was <clears throat> just like a an evidence room. It was uh, a wire cage. It was locked all the time. You had to go to somebody and fill out a, a slip to take things in and out. So it would it would have gone technically the first 12 models, the, the ones, the kit bash models and the Boba Fett and everything else that got preliminaries turned over, it would come back and get in, go in the morgue. And until, uh, until they moved, the more they got a little looser after Dave Okada left because he was like a strict, he was like nothing leaves without a signature and all that stuff. Uh, it got a little loose, and then when they moved from the Kroger building over to uh, the new building, the morgue got disassembled, and it went, you know, it just exploded. You know, people had kind of free reign. So the champ, you know, but there's a good chance that somewhere along the way they just got dumped. You know, it was, uh, who needs this stuff anymore? So uh, the only... The only model that I worked on with the model shop at Prelim that I know, I, it, there is one that's still in existence. Um, and I knew who has it. And if you watch Netflix, Netflix carefully, everybody knows who has it. So it's not me. <laughs> I wish it were. I, 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 I wish it were too. Now, I think I'd on. ask a half a million dollars for it and see what happens. Yeah, well, there you yeah. go. <laughs> uh, before we get uh, questions from the audience, I do I do have another question. Are you familiar with um, Rebel Force Radio? They're the uh, number one Star Wars podcast uh, in the world, uh, and they have been for over a decade. And the uh, funny thing is, is that the, um, the one of the hosts, uh, Jason Swank, his wife, uh, Mrs. Swank, came up and asked him a question, and he couldn't answer it. So he brought it on his show last week, and I heard it, and I, I texted him and, and spoke to him about it. And I said I'd ask you the question because it's about the Luke Skywalker figure from uh, from the 1978. Oh, line. I will. Should I put that up, Kev? What? Should I put that up? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I thought you had, I thought you were going to put up the question I asked. Oh, no, 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 no. The visual. <laughs> and then, so, so you see this figure here, J uh, Jim? I do. I do. Why on earth <laughs> does he have a yellow lightsaber? Uh well. I can't, I, I have to admit, I had to go back and look at the movie again. Uh, the, the, uh, that was, a, the good thing is I can pass it off on someone else. It, I had nothing to do with the color. But at the time we were making toys for kids seven or eight years old. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> Darth Vader got a red lightsaber because his, in the movie, his, his lightsaber kind of had a red glow, and they gave and we gave uh, they gave uh, Ben Kenobi a blue one because it had a. And if you look at the movie, I had to look at it again. Luke and Ben Kenobi's lightsabers are the same color. the The glow is blue on both of them, and in the toy business, it just didn't make sense. So somewhere along the way, while they were doing production stuff. Um, Somebody said, "What color are we going to make it?" And they, Lucas approved the yellow, so that's why it's there. A lot of those things happened because we were moving a million miles an hour trying to get product on the on the shelf. Because we were we were really when I read this, if we had started the moment I read the script, if we had said go on that day, we would still not have had product until 1978. And that's just because of time, you know. We, took a long time. So I wish I had like, oh, well, you know, some idiot, but it was really more of a, we didn't, we didn't want two guys with the same color. Okay. So, so that makes sense. You're thinking, cause they're five-year-old kids. They should have, you got three figures, three car uh, colors, the three yeah. characters. That makes sense. We weren't making them for you guys. We were making it for the, your, your the sons and daughters of people you're in. Jim, Jim. Jim, you were making it for us, guys. It was us. It was pretty much us. <laughs> I was oh. five. I was five when Star Wars came out. Paul was four. That's right. And Mike Haven's parents were in their 20s, probably. Right. I don't know. I can't do math teenagers. backwards like that, man. <laughs> well, the, the, well, you the know what? The turnover models had uh, 
monofilament fishing line for lightsabers. Oh, cool. They were in those first models of those figures. The, uh, we were trying to figure out how to get a, a uh, lightsaber to come out of the hilt. So we, we had originally had a very thick monofilament fishing line on a spool in the back of those figures. And then you would pull it out and the, the, because of the way they manufacture fishing line, they always came out in the curve. They either went this way or they went that way. You know, they never went out straight and we couldn't find them. They couldn't find a material that had a memory of being straight so that you could roll over it up. So. I, lo I love the way you said monofilament and Mike is like, oh my God, monofilament. Because <laughs> Mike, if you haven't realized, is one of the biggest uh, Kenner collectors that I know. How many Boba Fett's do you have? You have over 400, don't you? Like seven something, I think. 700. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got like a tower. I don't know. I buy them when I walk by them. I mean, just on my desk right here, I've got about 25, 30 of them. <laughs> wow. Like all different ones from all different places. Like that one's Palatoy. I was just oh, thinking, oh, while you were talking, to Jim, I was thinking, you know what? That, that, uh, the early bird certificate package, um, even if you take Star Wars completely out of it, that is about one of the best marketing ideas that were ever invented in the history of the world. Unbelievable idea. I had nothing to do with it. Yeah, but I mean, Other than unbelievable idea, man. Yeah, but yes, you did. Here's the thing. Jim always talks himself down because <laughs> he doesn't believe how much, how important he was. If you weren't the guy that told, that's an awesome mug, you know. <laughs> I love it, the Looney Bird. Uh, Jim, Jim, for the camera to go on you, can you, can you just speak and hold up the camera so the mug, to hold up the mug so the oh, camera. I got him. Yeah, the there mug. you go. <laughs> that's an early one. Okay, uh, Mr. Havens, if you can go on with your nerds. Yeah, stuff. well, Jim always goes, oh, I had nothing to do with that. I had nothing to do with it. The thing you don't realize is if it wasn't for him, they would have never even picked up Star Wars. They would have never even picked up Star Wars. You were the actual real life nerd that said, this is awesome, make it. That is. Without you, there would be, what would we have? Tonka toys would have made it, man, and I'd be here with giant, I don't even know what's. Well, Jesus. technically I'd still be Take playing some with credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it, I, I do take, I mean, it, it is hard to be, uh, to, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not naturally, a bragger, so yeah. So I'll do it for you. Without Jim Swearingen, there would be no Star Wars toys. There. <laughs> it's it, it's it it actually this it's brought me a uh, great deal of pleasure uh, since I've you know I'm on my third career. You know, I was a designer and then a marketing person. Now I'm a uh, a uh, celebrity. You know. So. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, you're on the con panel, so you, I mean, we've only had celebrities on the con panel, is that yeah. right? Well, except for you and me, we're not celebrities. We're not. What about me? I'm not. <laughs> I'm you're up in a crazy Mike. person that throws money at a convention for some reason. <laughs> Mike, you're, you're, you're up and coming. You're doing, you're, yeah. you're not bad, young man. All right. If anybody's watching from Lucasfilm, I will gladly stand in the back of any scene in whatever hot outfit you have for me. Don't care. <laughs> there you go. Any more freaking plugs, Mr. Nashville? Hey, man, if you know, all right, yeah, www.icnashville.com. Come check it out. <laughs> all right. Anyway, back to Mr. Swearingen. Yeah. yeah. So uh, did you, do you have a favorite toy in general? Or do you have a, a, like when you grew up as a kid, I mean, did you have a, a toy that you played with? Uh, well, I tell people that, you know, in Star Wars, what, as a toy designer, I, uh, I always kind of looked at it as what would I have done 20 years earlier? So I, you know, I was thinking of myself as a Star Wars, a kid watching Star Wars. So I envisioned doing the, uh, the dog fights with the X-Wing and TIE fighter. That's what immediate, I mean, that's obvious. You know, I came back that next day and said, we got to do this. And the X-Wing was the first thing we worked on, on spaceship wise. And I had my favorite toy uh, growing up was a Roy Rogers stagecoach because I saw Roy Rogers on TV. You know, I got a TV when in 1958 <laughs> with a black and white TV. And I had this stagecoach had horses and uh, 
there was Roy Rogers, and it went over more cliffs. You know, it, it tumbled down, you know, over cliffs, and the horses, you know, it would be, get torn up, and then had wheels that popped off and stuff. So that was the that was the toy that I kind of reminisce about it when I talk about Star Wars because it was the similar thing. You know, you can recreate what I saw on TV. I could recreate with the toys. Uh, that I had the toy that I had so it's really similar to Star Wars if you read Star Wars or you look at watch Star Wars and you can take an X-Wing and TIE Fighter or whatever ship you like and uh, recreate all that stuff you can fly around in the Millennium Falcon and do all that stuff so I that's kind of how um, how the whole that's you know that's what when I read the script the first time that was like this is just so obvious, you know, toy-wise. It was there was just one after another. Every page had a different thing you could do, and we didn't really know what anything looked like. We had a snapshot of an X-wing and a Tie Fighter, but um, we hadn't really seen anything until I went out in April to actually see an X-wing and Tie Fighter. And the Death Star was we had we had a, a description of it, but we didn't actually have any reference for it. So, and and it was real early. Uh, George and his group were, um, they hadn't really dealt with the licensing end of things and how much material and information we needed. So they, they uh, were kind of a little behind the, the eight ball time wise because when I said, well, I need, you know, I need multiple views of an X-Wing and a TIE fighter and the Millennium Falcon and the, I need the lightsabers and all, you know, all that stuff. And I want to know, you know, I have to, what does the TIE fighter and the X-Wing sound like? They didn't have any of that information already stored. Now it's all done ahead of time. They, they know everything, you know, a year ahead of time. The people at Hasbro know what the next movie is. So whatever that is. So when we were first starting, it was like, oh, you need all that <laughs> right now? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, you know, the faster we get it, the sooner we'll have it on the shelf. So, yeah, that was one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons I went out in April was to try and find all that materials. Yeah, so uh, from my point of view, from working as a jewelry designer, we had the same thing. We had, you know, 14 months before uh, before the Force Awakens came out, we had a whole, you know, 200-page booklet of every character and design and logo. They they had made their own logos. And then uh, ships and stuff like that. So it's a it's a different process today. It's, it, they're more aware of uh, what's coming down the road and making sure that they'll make the most money if they prepare as early as possible. Yeah, I mean, Star Wars changed so much about licensing and the movie business and the toy business you know, all in one. Because it it really up in that up to that point, you know. The 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 amount of material that's done to pre pre before the thing goes on air, it's just completely different. You know, they've got digital files and you can download stuff. They didn't even, you know, we had to, we had to develop license, the logos and packaging and all that stuff. Now that's all predetermined. So. Paul, do you, uh, do you have any more questions from the online group? We do have uh, several questions actually. Oh, uh, right. let's, well, here we have one from Paul Manzione. And he asks, what was the item or person that you wanted to make from the original trilogy that was never manufactured? Ooh. Never manufactured, but there's a lot that has still. Um, that's a toughie. I mean, I, uh, while I was there, I mean, there were some, you know, I would have liked to, earlier on done some more of the special the ships the y wings and the the uh, the stuff like that we uh we didn't have enough uh material early on to really go very far there's some characters probably would be cool we never did darth tar you know the moff tarkin that i mean he's the really the lead bad guy at that point in the very first one and he, it took till now practically for for the figure to come out. It's like, wow, that's that's amazing. 
He had the die. Really I'll agree with the fact that it was Tarkin. I was 79, 80, 81. I was waiting for Tarkin. You know, yeah. I won't, he was my second favorite character. Definitely. We have well, one more question. Paul? Yes, from Kayati Randy. Uh, did Jim come up with the idea for the trapdoor mechanism on the Dewback and the Tauntaun? Oh, he probably already. Yes, I did. <laughs> that was my invention because we had stiff legged figures and they had to ride a Dewback, and side saddle doesn't even work. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that the invention that was my invention. That I'm pretty that's my and my last the, the Tauntaun was one of the last things I worked on. Uh, I, I, at that point, I was transitioning out of uh, design and then on to, into the dark side. I, I was transitioning into marketing. <laughs> so, marketing is the dark side. That's true. It is. Yes, <laughs> uh, among designers, <laughs> that, that was definitely the dark side. Cool. But, uh, yeah. We do have a couple more questions. If you're okay with that. Uh, Glenn sure. Nelson it's, asks. It's a freaking interview. It's a freaking interview, Paul. <laughs> Listen, I can whatever, shut you off right now. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever jerk you have asking a question right now, ask it of this jerk. <laughs> it's Glenn Nelson, so. I knew. I knew you said Glenn Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> have has Jim seen any of the real toys in the Mandalorian? The real toys. Yeah, I think I think he means the toys that have come out uh, recently for the Mandalorian. Have you seen Have you seen how it's evolved to what you guys had to what's being done now? That, that, uh, if I can paraphrase what he's asking. Yeah. Well, they, I have I have a child in I have <laughs> I have a child in my closet. Um, and <laughs> you want to. <laughs> um. <laughs> you want to be careful the way you say it. <laughs> oh, not a real child. I have the child in my. In my closet. I, but Lucasfilm would like to appreciate, like to thank you for calling it the child and not baby Yoda. <laughs> I, know. I, 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 I know better. You know, I, I want to stay on their good side. You never know. They might invite me to a celebration. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, I, I have not seen, I've only seen photographs. I've seen people that have built the his ship, which is, I'm amazed. You know, the, the they've printed the ship parts. I'm, and, uh, crest, yeah. and I'm yeah. waiting for uh, a Mandalorian. I haven't, I have, I've, um, I ordered one online, but I haven't seen it. So, and I, I'm excited that this, that show is pretty interesting. I'm, I'm curious what they're going to do with product because there really haven't been very many, uh, there haven't been very many new, like new vehicles, except for his, and some, you know, speeder bikes and stuff. They're a little different, but uh, I'm curious to see how it goes. I'm really fascinated by that whole technology thing, that the green screen surround. You know, that it's just astounding what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thought it was the show was kind of interesting. I, it's pretty weird. When you look at it from a from a design point of view, they haven't got there isn't a lot yet to make toys out of. I mean, there's stormtroopers and there's Mandalorians and some of the some of the uh, the other bounty hunter characters, but there isn't really very much there from a product standpoint yet. That's an interesting comment. Yeah. I, I, but collectors, anything you put out there, collectors are going to buy. So. so, so Paul, do we have uh, time for maybe one or two more questions? Yes. Anthony Hansen asks, are there any prototypes of figures that nobody knows about or have never been photographed that you know that we don't know? <laughs> no, I, it just, I don't know anything. You know, all the, 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 all the prototypes that I worked on that I knew about are either in somebody's collection or they've long been gone they're all lost but i don't have any of them so one last question i think uh from andy houston what necessitated the two styles of tauntauns one's with the belly cut and the other one doesn't have the belly cut why didn't they just make them into one tauntaun 
uh, the one without was a first production, and the second one was an update. They needed, they wanted, you wanted, you know, one more you could buy. You know, it was collectability stuff. You know, even then, they were looking, you know, you can make a commercial out of the one with the open belly. So it was, let's do something new. Very interesting. Could that, could that also be a, an engineering point of view? Because then you'd have two holes in the same tauntaun. The saddle would be hard to leave to put on. It would. It would be. Might be more difficult to have one with a, a hole in its belly and then a hole in its its spine. Yeah, I. I mean, it, from a from a manufacturing point of view, it's no big deal. But I, you know, they just. I think it was more. They just wanted. It was a cool part of the movie, and they wanted to, you know, put something out there they could advertise. Now, now, Paul, I didn't ask you if you had a question for Jim. I only asked if you if if, if the if the uh, listeners did. That's true. Um, all right. How much money did the original line make? What the nope. fuck kind of question? <laughs> is that? You're asking that. <laughs> well, I mean, I know, like I, from watching that show, uh, the one they had, the toys that made us. Kenner was a, a successful company, but Star Wars, I'm sure, took it to a completely different place for them. Oh yeah, and they made they made a lot of money. It it uh, it certainly catapulted them from middle of the middle of the pack to the you know we competed directly with Mattel for a long time. It was between Hasbro, Kenner, and Mattel, and the, and Star Wars really put us on the map. It was, uh, and put, you know, it, it really, it led to a lot of other stuff for sure. You know, we, we would, Kenner was a really innovative company. You know, after that, there were some other movies like Jurassic Park. Um, that product line was, a, was again a design driven product line because the designers said, it's not just dinosaurs. These are Steven Spielberg dinosaurs. So that kind of stuff. We did a lot of stuff that was pretty innovative. And even on the girl side, because I went to Strawberry Shortcake after Ken. I went from the dark side to the pink, dark pink side. <laughs> I, was, I was the product manager for Strawberry for five years and actually competed with Mattel for, on Barbie. One year we... Uh, about three years in, we were neck and neck with the biggest girls' toy line in the in the world. So. Well, well done, you. Yeah, and, I had a um, good time. Gonna, I'm just going to ask one last question. I'm actually going to depart from Star Wars for a second. When you said you made the six million dollar man doll, was that like the uh, was that like the twelve inch one that his arm rolled up? Uh, yeah, that design. was a team. That was a team project. Um, we we got the TV program stuff early, and a group of people got together and uh, we brainstormed how are we going to put that guy on t on into a toy? And I, I my claim to fame is his bionic eye. Okay, yeah, yeah. We took a GI Joe and cut a big hole in the back of his head and put a uh, a door peephole through the back of it, and that was the preliminary model. It was. That was the model, and then somebody else came up with the idea of uh, the. We took a the arm from a GI Joe and put a balloon over it. It was just a long, skinny balloon, and rolled it up. And that's how the the conceptually, those were all like separate pieces. And then we turned that over to production design group, and they uh, they did all the you know made it look hard, look good. But it was a that was a group project. It was like. Another one where we were pressed and pressed on time. We wanted to get it out in time for uh, for Christmas. So, no, that was a great. So, so literally, the uh, the two things I remember before Star Wars was Stretch Armstrong and the Six Million Dollar Man uh, yeah. twelve inch figure. I, I had I had both of those. It's so interesting. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for joining us this week in the con panel. Uh, uh, Mike, you got a last, uh, a last, uh, spew of information for ICC 2021. Yeah. It needs an extra C <laughs> it's, uh, ICC con, but, um, no, uh, all I want to say is, um, 
it's a little bit different. It's different than a regular convention. It's more focused on the fans and the people and uh, the kindness and wonderful things that come out of this hobby. Whether it's learning about something old or vintage or buying something that is unbelievably impossible to find or just meeting up with friends from the community that are from all over the world. It's the place for that. And uh, I don't know, in this time and the way it is and everything like that, I mean, we need to we need to have something to look forward to. And I'm not going to pitch it to you. I'll just say the light at the end of the tunnel is ICCCon. Check it out, icnashville.com. Uh, the hashtag is hashtag ICCCON. And what else you want me to tell you, Kevin? I also I run 22 Facebook amazing. groups about Star Wars. You can join those, www.imperialcommissary.com. I, I'm just surprised you actually said with all that's going on in the world, my convention is the light at the end of the tunnel. That it is. is. I that am is completely the most sure. Pitiful ploy I've ever no, 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 no. It's not even a ploy. Uh, here's the thing, man. I see this every single day. People are looking at bad stuff. People are looking at sad stuff. Giant corporations are scared to death and will not put their money and their time on the line. So there are no other conventions. There is no one else planning. Everyone is in a holding pattern, scared to death. And we are going to come out of this thing because we are strong. We are resilient. We are human beings. And I have 100% faith that this is just a blip on the radar. We do not go running around, hiding behind doors and hiding in our homes because the Black Plague happened, brother. So that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to make it a sales pitch or something like that. I'm trying to say that, man, look forward to the future. Every single person that's watching this, look forward to the future. Stop being stuck in the now. Be safe. Be healthy. But, man, we are going to come out of this. We're going to come out stronger. And in today's society, I feel there's a lot of people that feel like, the sky is falling, and this is the end of the world, but we're going to be okay. We We've been are doing this for world. hundreds of years. <laughs> we are the children. You, you, you we know are, what, man. What, uh, and you know what? There are bad times in the 80s that called out that song. So, You know what, Mike? I appreciate what you just said, and I'm going to retract what I said. I mean, Because I forget just one thing I love about your show, and, and you know me. I work, I work at 18 to 20 shows a year. Uh, yeah. I have a booth. I do the stage hosting thing, whatever. And uh, yours is one of the best. It's because I like shows that are just solely Star Wars. And your show is about 90% Star Wars, if you don't mind me saying. And yeah, it's it's about, okay. That's just what I know. So, yeah. <laughs> and they're real passionate fans that are there. They love Star Wars. They know Star Wars. And it's just, it's a fun show. And it's just great going down to Nashville. If you're, you know, you're from the Northeast, you know, it's nice to take a nice trip. So, you're right. It, it is going to kind of be the light at the end of the tunnel. Because we're likely not going to, my next convention is probably going to be, um, I I see Nashville. That's what I'm saying, man. Do you know any of the corporate bigwigs that are planning conventions right now? Nobody. Just I, I crazy know, old I know Mike producer, down in Tennessee. I know the producer of the show is telling me that it's only an hour long and we've gone over. So I just want yeah. to send it to Jim for one last time. Jim, you got Doing any one final of these? thoughts? <laughs> you got any final thoughts of your time in Kenner or how much you think I'm an awesome host or anything like that? <laughs> well, I do. I, I do uh, I'll just I'll plug Michael a little bit. He does put on a great show, and the venue this year is going to be amazing. I saw the video last night or yesterday. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, I, Kenner was uh, definitely the most exciting part of my career. Star was the beginning of it, but, and I worked at Kenner and Hasbro, so I know both cultures a little bit. They're very, they were very different. Now it's all a big one, so. And uh, no, I'm, I, I had a great time. And I really do enjoy meeting all these uh, nerds, as they call themselves, because that, that's what I was. I mean, I was a, star, a, a science fiction fan from uh, the time I was a little kid and uh, saw THX 1138 wasn't when I was in college. So it was... Uh, it's been a great time, and I enjoy meeting all those people and all the sad stories about mom throwing their stuff out or whatever they are. So, all now, right, you can. Uh, so, so, well, Jim, I want to thank you again for coming. This was a really great, uh, great time you. to talk. Great seeing you again. I love love hanging out with you. We've had yeah. dinner a couple times, and and uh, Mr. Havens, I want to thank you too for coming. And you can see both of these gentlemen at ICCC in Nashville next year in their new location, which is a seventeen minute drive from uh, Steak and Shake. I checked because I like Steak and Shake. But, uh, you can go to the Steak and Shake South, man. You can get there a lot quicker. I'll show you another go, one. 
don't interrupt <laughs> my closing Mike Haven. I can't help it. Yeah, I know me. But anyway, so this is my closing. But Paul, I want to say uh, thank you very much again for uh, a great show. And we'll see you next week. Next week, we're going to have, not from Star Wars, we're going to have a Klingon. Ooh. Ooh. For the Klingon panel, thank you very much. All right, good night. Yeah.